Did you know that you may have a built-in fuse tester in your RV and you didn't even know about it? If you have a power station such as this, chances are you actually have one. This is a WFCO distribution panel. It has both AC and DC distribution buses in it. However, in this video, we will be looking at the DC bus only. This is a simplified diagram of a typical RV DC distribution system. The distribution panel consists of a set of fuses that allow each individual 12 volt DC circuit to be connected to the common 12 volt system. The 12 volts is supplied either by a deep cycle battery in a mobile situation or if on shore power, that is 120 volts AC, by a DC combiner. A combiner is just another word for a DC power supply. That combiner typically includes a battery charger. It's interesting to note that the combiner battery charger and battery are connected through the distribution panel rather than to each other. The battery may also have some directly connected circuits to it, such as levelers, slide-out motors, and even a solar charger. But those are beyond the scope of this video and we won't discuss it further. And here we've removed the fuse board from the WFCO distribution panel. And there are 11 circuits, starting with circuit 1 here, going to the right to circuit 11, and then the fuse we have starting 1 and going to 11. But I only have fuses in 4 of the 11 circuits. This is a negative post. This is a positive post where you would connect a battery. And the VCC post is where you would connect the combiner. The combiner and battery are connected together with these two 40 amp fuses. Now not all combiner battery chargers are integral to the WFCO panel. Some are internal, some are external. An external combiner will have its own set of output fuses. And here's a tip. If you have an external combiner battery charger and you have problems with the battery being charged, you check the fuses on a combiner and they're okay. You might want to check and see if you have these 40 amp fuses inside of the fuse panel and those could be blown preventing the battery charger combiner from connecting to the battery. Across the top there is an LED for each circuit. That LED is there to illuminate if the fuse is blown. However, it doesn't always work. But the good news is, it can also be used, in some cases, to check for a short. In order to use the LEDs to check for shorts, we need to know exactly what happens when the fuse blows. Here we see a simple circuit consisting of the fuse and the fuse panel, with the blown fuse detector across the fuse, plus a switch and a light bulb for a load. And, since there is zero volts across the fuse, the fuse detector is off. In normal operation, if we turn the switch on, the light bulb will energize, and we turn the switch off, and it will de-energize. In both cases, there are still zero volts across the fuse. This is normal operation. If the fuse blows while the circuit is in operation, as shown by the switch being closed, then the circuit will power down and the blown fuse detector will illuminate because now there is 12 volts across the fuse. In reality, the blown fuse detector is now the new load and the old load, or short, is just simply a path to ground. This is a safe condition as there is not enough energy going through the detector to burn out the wiring in the circuit. In this case, the blown fuse detector tells us that we have a bad fuse. If we turn the switch off on the load, the blown fuse detector now goes off. That is because the detector requires a path to ground to work. With the switch open, there is no path to ground, so the blown fuse detector will be off even though we have a bad fuse. This is worth repeating. The blown fuse detector will not always detect a blown fuse. It will only detect a blown fuse if the circuit would otherwise be energized. Let's say you go into the RV one evening, turn the light switch on, no lights. Without turning the switch off, go to the distribution panel and see if you have a red light. That will tell you if you have a fuse that's blown or not. Then go back and turn the switch off until you can figure out why the fuse is blown. 
Well, let's say if you have a short in the wiring and the fuse blows and the blown fuse detector is turned on. If the short is before the switch, as shown here, you will always have a path to ground for the fuse detector to work. Again, this is not an unsafe condition because, like before, the blown fuse detector is the new load and the short is simply the path to ground. And in this case, it does not matter if the switch is on or off because the short occurs before the switch. If the short occurs after the switch, then the blown fuse detector will be on or off depending on the position of the switch. So there is a distinct behavior in the action of the blown fuse detector, and the more you know what happens, the better you are able to analyze the problem. Let's see how we can troubleshoot that by example. I've connected a power supply to the fuse board, and you can see I have a light on circuit 1 right here, and that light is on so this fuse is passing the current to the light. But if I remove this fuse, this is going to mimic, of course, a blown fuse. You can now see the LED light on the board indicating that the fuse is blown. This light typically is on a light switch, so if we mimic the switch and disconnect the light, look what happens the LED, it turns off. So the LED is on indicating that the fuse is blown. When you turn the light switch on, you turn the light switch off, the LED turns off. That means that this fuse detector is not always on when the fuse is blown. It is only on when the fuse is blown and there's a load on the circuit. That's very important. But as I said in the beginning, we can also use this to check for a short. So let's try that now. This is a wire that goes to the circuit. If we ground it out, which is actually a short, you can see again that we have the LED on. And that LED is on whenever we have a short. So you can use this to detect for shorts. And then you just start going through and troubleshooting until you find the source of the short circuit. And when that goes out, you know that the short is gone. But what if you don't have a fuse panel that has the indicators on it? What do you do then? Well, you can buy these smart fuses. These are made by Low Fuse, but Busman and others make similar versions. These basically have an LED inside of the fuse that will illuminate if the fuse blows. And I have one here, and I actually busted the link in this fuse so this fuse is open. Just to show you that when we connect the fuse, you can see that the fuse blown indicator is lit. So basically this will allow you to retrofit any fuse panel with an indicator. And for illustrative purposes, I disassembled the fuse and located the LED circuit board as you see here. There are two LEDs and two resistors that are wired in a back-to-back -back fashion. And that's just about as basic of a circuit as you can get. And while this is not as sophisticated as the LED indicator on the WFCO panel, it does work. Caution! In the following troubleshooting steps, there is no fuse in the circuit. While the risk to the circuit wiring is low due to the low current the test devices present, caution must be exercised when using them. Never leave such test devices connected and unattended. I've also come up with some alternative methods of determining whether or not this fuse is blown. Well, the first one is just simply a pilot light with a fuse block on the end of it. And this fuse block is made by a company called General Technologies. And the set is a CT6100. In the kit, you'll receive an ATOE ATC type fuse block, an ATM type fuse block, and a maxi fuse block. The fuse blocks have standard quarter inch lugs on the end. So all I did is I took this incandescent light and I just put some terminals on there and connected it to the end. Now the reason I'm using an incandescent light is because an incandescent light is non-polarized. So no matter which way I put this in, it will always be the correct polarity. So let's plug this in. And you can see that the light is on. But this is not lit. The reason for that is basic Ohm's law. This light bulb is actually in series with this light. This does not have enough voltage across it to light this bulb. However, look what happens when I cause a direct short across this light. You see now this light is off. And if you can see, this light is on. So what this really does is this will detect a short.
In other words, if you run across a blown fuse light, just plug this in. And if this is on, that means you have it short somewhere in your line. If this is off, then that means that probably just a fuse blew. So this is kind of an indicator that gives you the idea of whether or not you have a short. Because remember earlier in the video I said that with this blown fuse detector, you can't tell if it's a direct short or if it's just a blown fuse. And I have a similar one. This is one I built and designed. Well, this one, you can just plug it in like so. And again, if we disconnect the short, the buzzer goes off. Like the incandescent light, if the LED on the bore detector illuminates without the buzzer, you likely have a blown fuse. If the buzzer sounds, you likely have a short circuit. And if you have a fuse block that does not have the onboard LED indicators, you could again use this, plug it in, and it'll work like before. Or if you build the buzzer circuit, the same thing holds true for that as well. You can plug this bulb right into here, and you can stick this in the ground control 3.0 if you have one, which is the leveling system, and you can troubleshoot the 35 amp maxi fuses. There are limitations to both the buzzer and the incandescent light, whether or not they will properly detect a short versus a blown fuse, but for the majority of the time, they're accurate. Now this video is getting kind of long, so I'm going to produce another video on how to make these little gadgets. And I'll publish that on the website that I'll reference here, so you can go to that website and build the circuits. You know, the buzzer thing was only around $5, and it is really a simple thing to do. And it's a neat little soldering project if you've never done that before.